Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we thank you for coming back to join us again this afternoon through our morning technical difficulties. Uh, so I welcome you. Uh, I welcome the seven people sitting in front of me, as well as all those of you who are streaming in from points beyond. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my wife and I received a text uh, yesterday about a woman who was born in 1918. She is 102. And I suppose due to the present crisis, she was asked to list all the adversities through which she has lived. Not that she has had these, but she uh, has lived through the times when they were ravaging our society, so to speak. Uh, the list is very interesting. It's very long. And it includes things like diphtheria, smallpox, polio. Uh, she listed the Great Depression. She listed World War II. And the list was, as I said, very long. The thing that got my uh, attention was the last statement. <clears throat> and that goes somewhat like this. I'm not uh, quoting verbatim, but I can give you the gist. And it sa and she said, I'm just happy to be in my home, the same home in which I have lived for 65 years. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 1 verses 9 and 10, and I'm sure we're probably familiar with this, what has been done will be again. I'm sorry, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. There is nothing new under the sun. These stressful times in which we live have come and gone. They're new to us. Uh, I suppose there are some of you out there, I'm sure there are some of you out there that lived through World War II. Uh, there was rationing and that sort of thing then. Uh, I, for one, and most of us, I would say, probably haven't lived through that. So these are new times for us, and they're stressful times uh, because, because of the unknown. What do we do? You know, where's this going to go? How long is this going to last? And also importantly, what do we do as a body in Christ? What does the church do? Well, what we have done at Pleasant Hill here, after much discussion, after uh, many suggestions back and forth and prayers and discussion, texts, lots of texts, uh, we have decided to do uh, our service in this format. We're striving to do the best we can to obey God, Hebrews 10 and 25. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And also to obey men. Romans 13 and 1, to obey our governments. Romans 13 and 1, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. We are doing the best we can to bring the body together in these circumstances. Please, please appreciate that. Please bear with us. Please pray for us. Uh, we will be observing the Lord's table today. Uh, we encourage you to do so with us. Uh, if you desire not to do that, we urge you not to violate your conscience. If you feel that that is not the thing to do, please, please don't. Uh, we urge you to follow your conscience. Whether you participate or whether you do not, either way, follow your conscience. And whatever choice you make, please make that choice with love and forgiveness in your hearts toward the brethren, not judgment. Let's remain strong in the faith with love in our hearts toward one another and forgiveness in our hearts towards one another. Let's look to the joy that awaits in heaven. Let's remain strong in the faith and strong in love one for each other. Let's look to the time when we can all physically meet together once again. Remember, there is nothing new under the sun. And as brought out in this woman's text, this too shall pass. With that, I will read the order of service uh, today, and uh, we will begin our service with an opening prayer by Brother Jason Brady. We'll then have two songs. 
We'll then have New Testament reading by Brother Tom Brady, and that will be the, in the 10th chapter of John. We will have two songs, and then Mark Herman, Brother Mark Herman will lead us in the study of John. We will have one song, and then we will have collection remarks by Marty Williamson. Please keep in mind that we are not taking up the collection. We will lay by in store, and we will take up the collection at such time as we are able to meet again. Marty will have more of that. Pardon? Uh, so after the collection, we will have a song, and then we'll have a, a Lord's Table uh, by Marty, Brother Marty Williamson. He will bless the bread, and we will partake of it. And then we will have Blessing on the Cup by Brother Kelly George, and we will partake of it. Keep in mind, that's different than we did last week. Last week, we blessed both emblems and partook of them. This way, we will be striving to do it in a more traditional manner. After our Lord's table, uh, we will have announcements and closing prayer by Brother Mark Herman. Once again, I thank you for joining us. I, I thank you for all your desire to meet with the Brotherhood. And uh, we will continue with our service. And we, if you will bow with us, we will have our opening prayer by Brother Jason Brady. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this morning where we can gather together from our separate places about the nation and take this time to study your word together, not in person, but certainly of like mind and faith. We're thankful for the wisdom of those that are broadcasting the service this morning. We're thankful for the desires of the leaders that of our churches that have come together and made this opportunity for each of us to do this. We're thankful for the desire of all the people who are participating this morning, Father. It's very touching to consider that in this time that we're having here in our nation. We're thankful that we live in a time where this is even possible, Father, and especially thankful that we live in a place where we are free to worship you as we see fit. And of course, Father, as we always are, so thankful for you, for your son Jesus, his life on earth, and his death, and resurrection, and the Bible that lists all these things, that we could study it and understand your word and follow and perhaps someday spend an eternity with you. We pray for all the participants this morning that they can use this time to gather the things that are presented to better their lives and draw themselves closer to you. We pray that you would be with the presenters they might bring forth their thoughts in a way that would benefit those that are here. We pray for all of our family and friends and loved ones around the nation, whatever their desire may be this morning, Father, whether they are sick or need healing or spiritual healing or just need us to reach out to them and give them a word of comfort. We pray that you would help us in that time. We pray that you would be with the leaders of our nation. This is something that Certainly in our lifetime, we've never gone through anything like this. And we pray that you would continue to guide them as they make wise decisions to help us through this. We pray that you would continue also, Father, to be with the leaders of our churches. We pray, Father, that if your will be, that we would have a quick end to this crisis that we're going through. We pray that all the things that we say and do today will edify us that they will glorify your name. Please, Father, where we've fallen short of your glory, forgive us those heirs. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Faithful love flowing down From the thorn-covered ground Makes me hope.
saves my soul, washes whiter than snow. Faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, dries each tear, holds my hand when I can't stand on my own. Faithful love. Show the Father's love, and I'll never be the same, for I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is His name, faithful love is a friend. Just when hope seems to end, welcome face, sweet embrace, tender touch filled with grace, faithful love, endless power, living flame, spirit's fire, burning bright in the night, guiding my way, faithful love. Show the Father's love, and I'll never be the same, for I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is His name, for I've seen faithful love. I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high I'll live with Him forever in glory by and by Oh yes, I'll live in glory, live in glory high and by I'll tell and sing love story, tell love story high and high Then with my dear Redeemer, then no oh, more, oh, more to die Oh yes, I'll live in glory, glory by and by I want to be your service along this pilgrim way And lead the lost to Jesus as fervently I pray as day by day I travel, I'll keep him ever nigh And live with him forever in glory by and by Oh yes, I'll live in glory, live in glory by and by I'll tell and sing a story, tell a story on high There with my dear Redeemer, then no more to die Oh yes, I'll live in glory, glory by and by and I know it's nearing, by faith I look away To younger on supernal, the land of endless day I'll cling to him forever, and look beyond the sky And spend the endless ages in glory by and by Oh yes, I live in glory, living by and by I'll tell and sing the story, tell and stay on high there with my dear Redeemer, then no oh, more, more to, to die. Oh, yes, I live in glory, glory by and by. This morning's New Testament reading is John 10, 1 through 30. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a rob, robber. And he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and leads them out. And when he brings them out, his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, 
but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am a door. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. But he who is a hireling and not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must uh, bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. The command I have received from my Father. Therefore there was a division among them. The Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked to the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness in me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Tis a sweet and glorious thought that comes to me. Olive, olive, on, yes, olive, on. Jesus saved my soul from death and now I'm free. Olive, olive, on, yes, olive, on. Olive, on, and on, yes, olive, on, and on through eternity. Olive, on, and on. Olive, on, and on, yes, olive, on. When my body's lying in the cold, cold clay, I'll live on, live on, yes, I'll live on. I will meet my Jesus in the judgment day. I'll live on, live on, yes, I'll live on. I'll live on and on, yes, I'll live on and on through eternity. I'll live on and on, I'll live on and on, yes, I'll live on and on through eternity. I'll live on, yes, I'll live on in the glory land with God upon the throne. I'll live on. Sullivan, who eternal ages singing home sweet home. Hallelujah, yes, Sullivan. Hallelujah, yes, Sullivan. And on through eternity, Hallelujah, and on. Hallelujah, and on. 
and you still live on and on through eternity. With heavenly hue and frame the worlds with his great mind. There is a God, he is a God, he is alive, he is alive in every living, and we survive, and we survive from the star God. the prophets heard. He is the God that we should know, who speaks from His inspired Word. There is a God, he is a God, He is alive, he is alive in Him we live, and we survive, and we survive from the star God. They cannot find, for God alone does understand. There is a God, there is a God, He is alive, he is alive. in Him we live, and we survive, and we survive from the star God. Sin my set men free, and evermore with him could be. There is a God, there is a God, he is alive, he is alive in him we live, and we survive, and we survive from the star God. All right, we're uh, back to uh, studying the uh, book of John. Um, uh, we did a review last week of uh, the book of John, and if you want to check that out uh, sometime later, you can, you can do that. Um, I would like to thank Tom Brady for uh, reading the first 30 verses of uh, John 10 for us today. Uh, if you're following along the reading, you know that this uh, uh, Gospel of John, this chapter in the Gospel of John is about uh, sheep parable of a sheep that Jesus is uh, talking to us about. And there is an uh, Old Testament parallel to that uh, chapter in Ezekiel and uh, 34. And that's where I want to actually start today because it's important, I think, that we do a back context on uh, uh, knowing uh, the context of how, what Jesus is saying in John chapter 10 when he says that I am the good shepherd. Uh, there's a prophecy about the good shepherd, and it's in Ezekiel uh, chapter uh, 34. So if, if you can turn there, um, I would like you to turn there and kind of uh, read along uh, with us on there. Uh, Ezekiel 34, I'm going to start in the 23rd verse. This, this whole chapter is a parallel to John 10, and it talks about bad shepherds and uh, God being upset with them. And then uh, God uh, says this, starting in uh, uh, verse 23. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them and rid the land of wild beasts so that they may live in the desert and sleep in the forest in safety. I will bless them in the places surrounding 
my hill. I will send down showers in season. There will be showers of blessing. The trees of the field will yield their fruit and the ground will yield its crops. The people will be secure in their land. They will know that I am the Lord. When I break the bars of their yoke and rescue them from the hands of those who enslave them, they will no longer be plundered by the nations, nor will wild animals devour them. They will live in safety and no one will make them afraid. I will provide for them a land renowned for its crops and they will no longer be victims of famine in the land or bear the scorn of the nations. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the sovereign Lord. You, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture are people, and I am your God, declares the Sovereign Lord. We're going to come back to this uh, later on and kind of get some of the uh, beginnings of the chapter. But you'll see here that, uh, that God promised that um, his servant David would be the, the good shepherd to his people. Now this writing in Ezekiel is 400 years after, after the King David. So it can't be King David. Who's he referring to? To here, he's referring to the son of David. It's a prophecy of the coming Messiah, the King, the Christ. This is another prophecy that the Jews would have totally understood about in their writings that there was the promised Messiah, the King that they were all waiting for, uh, would be uh, their good shape, shepherd or claim to be um, their good shepherd. So it's, it's really important, I think, that we have that back context. So in reading John 10, we understand why they are so mad at him when he eventually claims that he is the good shepherd. What Jesus is saying there is that I am who God has promised uh, that was coming. And as we're going through the book of John, we talked about last week, we're on a treasure hunt. We're looking for uh, the seven miracles of John. Or we're looking for the seven I am statements. We've had several I am statements already, and they're all things that God had provided them. But Jesus says, I am the new things. I am, now you had bread, you had man in heaven. I am the bread of life, is what uh, Jesus claims. You had the pillar of fire that led them to the wilderness. Jesus says, I am now the light of the world. And of course, they had uh, this prophecy about the, the shepherd, and Jesus in this chapter is going to be saying that I am uh, the, the great shepherd as we go uh, through this. So it's important, I think, that we had that uh, particular uh, context. Um, if you, know, if you have questions at any time, please start uh, throwing them in. Nick's going to kind of cut me off, and we have ever uh, some questions or comments, and we have try to have a microphone set up here so maybe we can uh, hear some comments that are in this room too. So if you have comments and you want to say something, please feel uh, obliged to do so. We're going to just start here in the first, uh, first six verses. I think I'm just going to do like the first three verses uh, first. Because um, I, I left you with a question uh, last week, if you were interested in trying to figure it out, um, who the watchman is. So it depends on what version you have. It could be porter. It could be the uh, doorkeeper. Um, there's different uh, versions of that. But um, if, if we read in the first uh, couple of verses, it says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen or the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. I think we'll stop maybe uh, right there for a second. Um, let's see. If you can show one of the sl uh, slide... Uh, I don't know, let, me, let me look here. Slide 15. You have that on there? Okay. All right, so I want to just look at the, the sheepfold just for a second and uh, kind of look at the, the Greek for that. It's going to be coming up important uh, later in, in verse 16 that we kind of see a distinction um, on here. And so the, the, the Greek for the sheepfold or the sheep pen is uh, ale, A-U-L-A. It's uh, Greek 833 if you want to look it up. And I suggest you look it up. There's some interesting things uh, there about that. Um, this, uh, word is, I think it was 12 times, I believe, 12 times, uh, uh, translated in the New Testament. And, uh, you know, different translations will use a different English word for this, for the same thing. So you, so you get some different, uh, words for it. But the Greek word ale, um, seven times is translated as palace, like the palace court. When Jesus is brought in uh, to be put to death, they take him into the palace court. Uh, uh, John goes in there, and Peter tries to follow in there. 
uh, two into the palace court. Seven times the word is actually translated as palace. Twice it's translated as the hall. One time it's translated as the court. And then the last two times it's translated here in John 10. The first one is in uh, 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 10, 1, verse 1, the sheepfold that we're just, we just read. That's uh, all A. And um, it is translated as to the, the sheep pen or the sheep, uh, sheep fold, I think, in the King James. Um, it's also uh, translated as fold in verse 16. If you look down at verse 16, depending on what version you'll see, you'll, you might see fold and then flock later on the verse. But if you have the King James Version, you'll see fold and then you'll see fold again. So that first fold in verse 16 is the alle. It means the, uh, the, uh, the, the palace court or the... Basically what it means is it means a structure. A, a built structure with, with built barrier walls that keeps things in. That's important. It's, it's not a flock, which is roaming around in the pasture. It's, it's a penned up uh, group of sheep. They are penned up. They are in the uh, sheep fold. They're in the sheep pen. And uh, basically the way that this works is that this would be like at night and they would, there'd be many, many flocks all penned up in the same kind of corral, if you will, a, a wall. And uh, there was a, a shepherd that would be watching them, uh, the watchman or the porter. And that, that, it seems from what I've read that that might have been traded off by various, uh, by various shepherds that at night when all the flocks were brought back in from the pasture and they were all put into a communal sheep pen. They were all there and there was maybe one of the shepherds, it was their shift, if you will, to be able to watch them, uh, watch them that night. And so in the morning, shepherds would come back. The watchman that was in charge of watching all the sheep over the uh, nighttime would know that shepherd, would know that that's a person that has sheep in that uh, fold and uh, the shepherd would be able to call them out by name and the the sheep would know his voice and they would they would go out with him. But the watchman would be watching to know whether or not that shepherd uh, should be uh, coming in. So that that Greek alle really means a, a structure, a, a real structured uh, with walls and barriers that hold, hold uh, everybody in. Different from the word uh, flock, which we're going to have here um, a little bit uh, later. Okay, so that's kind of how it's uh, set up there. And um, so our questions, we have questions. We're not going to get through many of them today probably. But uh, question one is, uh, in this parable, who is, who is Jesus and who are his followers? Any comments on that? Who is Jesus and who are, who are his followers? We start with it. maybe a fairly easier question. It's a little more obvious maybe than who the watchman is. But who, who is Jesus in this uh, parable? Who is Jesus in this in this parable? Later, he's going to state. We haven't got quite got to the place where he states, "I am," and he says, "I am" twice. And he talks about two different things. So there's a couple different answers that we could say. But who is Jesus? What is Jesus represented by in this parable? He's, he's the shepherd. Right? He'd be the shepherd, right? And later on, he's going to say, "I am the good shepherd," right? He's also uh, technically the the gate, right, or the door, depending on your translation. I am the. He says later, "I am the gate," right. or "I am the door." He says he says those things. Who who are his followers? Well, that would be the disciples and, and, and any one that believes in, in the Lord. That right. He, that in, in, anyone that accepted him as his Lord and Savior and believes in and believes in him. Right, and it would include us, right? It would include us. Right. And and who and how are we represented in, in this whether we like it or not, how are we represented in this parable? The flock. We're the we're the sheep, right? We're the sheep, right? Yeah. Um uh, and we're sheep in the way I've heard, I was talking with Mike, uh, the other day and he was talking about, I've heard, you know, that sheep just try to find ways to kill themselves and that they're really dumb. And, and, uh, you know, it's always like, oh, I don't know if I want to be called a sheep, but that's kind of our, but you know, that's, that's kind of the problem. But the, the, the key is the sheep need a shepherd, right? right? The sheep need a shepherd to save them. That's what, that's what we need, they right? Need to be led. They need to be led and they need to be saved. And, and that's what we need. We need a good shepherd. So, so in that way, we are very much like, um, like the sheep. Okay, so the watchman. Who is the watchman, um, the porter, the gatekeeper? 
that knows the shepherd and knows whether or not that person's supposed to be claiming the sheep or not. Who who is that um, person? Because it, you know, we could say, well, maybe he's maybe that's Jesus. Jesus knows, you know, but but later on he says that I am the shepherd, so it seems like it might have to be somebody somebody else. Do we have any uh, comments on any comments coming through on that yet at all? Or uh, I don't see anything on the watchman. Um, a lot of okay. people respond that Jesus is the shepherd and the gate. Okay. Uh, Verity said that we are the sheep who need guidance. Right. Okay. Um, any comments oh, here? Um, elder, uh, Glenn Woody said elders, teachers. Elders or teachers? Okay. Uh, the watchmen. So elders of... Uh, uh, Alex Needham says watchmen is the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay. I, I think I said last time that I had kind of narrowed it down to three things that I thought technically the watchmen could, could fit the bill of. Um, I've backtracked now. I'm, I'm up to four now, <laughs> four different things. So um, I, I'm really interested in everybody's input. The good thing about the parable, I think, you know, Jesus had great parables. And the reason they're so good is because there's so many spiritual, basically, fulfillments of it. And we don't have to decide, well, yep, the watchman's this, and we all have to agree on that. There's going to be uh, really, I think, good answers on all sides of this. So would you have another comment? Eric Gowen says John the Baptist. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. All right. Are anybody throwing out any proofs for these things or? <laughs> no, just <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. John the Baptist would be a, a good example, right? Because John the Baptist was was the precursor. He was supposed to be watching, watching for him, right? And and pointing him out to people. Right. So it's, it, that makes it a great thing for him to be the watchman. Here he comes. Here comes the the shepherd. Right. Follow him. Right. Follow him. Telling the, the sheep, all of us, to follow him, right? John the Baptist opened the gate. John the Baptist opened the gate for him, right? He saw the shepherd come in. He opened the gate for him. That's very good. Very good. Anything? Do we have any other ones coming here? Uh, let's see. Holy Spirit, Alex says, Holy Spirit, because of the indwelling after baptism, marks us as his sheep. Good. It claims us as his, uh, as his sheep. Interrupt me if there's some more comments coming through. I'm going to kind of go to some passages here for some of these. So uh, the, the the first one I thought of right away um, that I felt like the watchman maybe probably had to be until I started looking at some other ones is I, I felt the watchman had to be God. You know, he, he is the overall watchman. He sees all things and he knows his good shepherd. He prophesied about him in, back in Ezekiel. He knows who the good shepherd's going to be before anyone knew. And so when the good shepherd comes, the watchman opens the gate for him and knows that he is, he is uh, um, the good shepherd. So, and the, the, the reason I was thinking that it could be, the, could be God is uh, uh, basically I just have, there's a whole bunch of verses you could go to, but even just further down in this chapter, I think we get down to verse 15. Um, verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me. And I know the Father. So Jesus says, the Father knows me and knows that I am the good shepherd. I think that fits really well with the watchman. The watchman is watching and knows that he's the good shepherd. I open the gate for him. So that'd be one, one place I think we could go to that the watchman might be the heavenly Father. That'd be, and there's other, obviously there's a lot of passages you could probably think of where we could go and, and show that the uh, Father could be the uh, watchman. Um, I guess real quick, I, I want to shift over to the Holy Spirit. I think Alex was talking about the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is the one that I, I added this week that I, I hadn't really thought of before. But there's uh, there's several passages, and I'm not going to go to them all. I'm just going to kind of read off some of them. But there is one I kind of want to go to that I think makes it seem like this could be the Holy Spirit. Um, 1 Corinthians 16 and 9, uh, when Paul's at Ephesus, he says, A great door for effective uh, uh, work has been opened. Um, 2 Corinthians uh, 2 and 12 at Troas, um, a door has been a door has been opened. Uh, Colossians 4 and 3, pray that a door might be opened to us. Acts 14 and 27, a door has been um, opened to the Gentiles. And all of these things are referencing to the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit opens a door in their heart or opens a door for an available work or an effective work. Um, all these are holy, uh, guided by the Holy Spirit. But I did want to look at Acts 16. And this kind of hit me the other night when we were doing our Acts study. 
um, that the, the Holy Spirit uh, often steered them where they needed to go, right? And, and opened the doors for them. Acts 16, 6 through 10. You don't have to go there if you don't want. I can read this out here. Um, I, I really like how this is. And if you have a map here, you'll really appreciate it. Uh, it says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. That would be to the left of them. They weren't going to go down to the left. The Holy Spirit said, no, not there. So they tried to enter Bithynia. That's to the right of them on their travels. That would have been to the right. Um, so we tried to enter uh, Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia saying, come over. And so the Holy Spirit completely was guiding them. Nope. You want to go to the left? You can't go to the left. Oh, well, let's go to the right. No, we can't go to the right. And then Paul has a vision. Go straight. Go forward over and sail over to Macedonia. There's work there that I'm opening for you. And so in that way, I think the watchman could be um, in reference to uh, the Holy Spirit as well. Any comments there so far? Or... Go ahead, Alonzo. So, so the direction where they was going, this was... Um first time that they were going to actually talk to the Gentiles? They weren't talking to the Gentiles at that point. Not at that point? No. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm, I was just a little confused because you said right. they were going. Well, Paul, I guess, would have been. Yeah. So, right. But they were, they had tried to come down. They were, they were traveling on their journey and they were going to try to enter this land here down in Asia. And they, right. they, uh, um, they, they, couldn't the holy spirit wouldn't let them go there and they then so they were going to come up here to the right over here in this land over here and holy spirit wouldn't let them go there too so they were going to go on over to uh Macedonia and Corinth and yes they would be talking to the gentiles well, who was all on this journey paul and and who what was all on this particular journey um this one it would have been paul and uh let's see it would have been silas on this one wouldn't it be uh acts 14 yeah, because Paul and Barnabas on the first journey, and then uh, uh, Silas went out with him on the second journey. I believe that's where we would have been on that. Okay. I think so. Oh, oh, oh. I have a feeling I might lose some stuff here. So, Okay, yeah, I think so, yeah. So the Holy Spirit could have been leading them on, on that. Um, let's go to Eric's comment about John the Baptist. Did he, did he put anything else about the, about John the Baptist? Uh, no, just that he thinks he's the watchman. Okay. So he does think he is the watchman, right? Okay. So, um, uh, it's, it's interesting that in this, uh, let's see, I guess if we go to, uh, Verity said Galatians 6, 1, uh, Christians, as Christians, we are watchmen for other Christians. Okay, all right. Yeah, well, refer to that too if we're talking about maybe the elders also, especially uh, watching for each other. Um, if you go look at John chapter 1, 23, verse 23, these are some references to John the Baptist. Uh, John 1, 23, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. Uh, that's a really good uh, paraphrase for him being the watchman, to open the gate for the Lord, that he was the one. If you go down to 30, verse 34, I have seen, I have seen, right? I'm, I'm watching. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. The, those verses are really good for making it seem, appear that, that John the Baptist would be a good, would really fit the bill for um, being the, the watchman. One of the reasons that I think that uh, another really, I think, strong proof for maybe uh, John the Baptist being uh, being the watchman. The problem is, is that Jesus doesn't come out and say, "Hey, remember the John ba Jesus was or the watchman was John the Baptist." He doesn't. He kind of lets that one uh, kind of hang out there for us to be able to discuss, which I think is great because then it opens up a lot of discussion. Discussion. But um, in this chapter in John ten, um, after this whole conversation about the sheep and the parable, all this things over, if you go to the end of this chapter. Jesus talks about they Jesus talks about John the Baptist. So it, to me, there's there's some real credibility that Jesus might have been you know referring to uh, the watchman as uh, John the Baptist. Down in verse forty, um, it said after he got done with all this and they tried to kill him again, 
It says, Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, Though John never performed a miraculous sign, right? Which means John wasn't, John wasn't the good shepherd. John wasn't the actual promised Messiah. Although John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. All that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus because they had realized, hey, this is where John was baptizing. Everything John said, he wasn't the person, he didn't do the miracles, but everything he said about Jesus has come true. He was the watchman. He was the one watching out for Jesus and pointing the sheep to him, to follow him. He even, remember we talked uh, last week in our review that a lot of Jesus' disciples were actually John's disciples before. And when Jesus showed up, John said, there he is. Go. Go and follow him. So he, he is the one. We've been watching for him. And I knew what to see because God himself told John, the one you see the Spirit falling on is the one. Mm -hmm. So John had been watching for that. He'd been watching for that. And when he saw that happen, when the Spirit of God lighted on Jesus and, and God proclaimed from heaven to the world, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. John the Baptist saw that. He was watching for that, and he knew to uh, be able to uh, uh, watch for that and send that out to uh, um, the sheep. Um, is there anybody else has anything on John the Baptist? Or There's probably some other passages we could go to. I just felt those were pretty pretty compelling for me, anyway, to, to think seriously about John the Baptist being the watchman. No, Eric just said that he always viewed the watchman as under the employment as uh, under the employ of the shepherd. Okay. And... All right. Um, the last thing I want to look at is, uh, and some people have mentioned about uh, us, you know, watching out for each other. Um, I do want to uh, mention um, the watchman being like um, elders of, of a flock. Now there's, there was only maybe a, a one watchman there, and then we probably need to have a plurality of elders. I, I know a uh, plurality of elders for me right now in this time is uh, a great blessing um, from God. But um, what's the duty of elders? You, you have a flock that you're in that you're in charge of, and you better be watching the door, right? And are we going to let anybody come in that that doesn't uh, that isn't Jesus Christ, or at least doesn't resemble Him? That doesn't that doesn't uh, follow after uh, Jesus. We need to we need to make sure that there's not false teaching and there's yeah. somebody that's uh, trying to jump over the wall or trying to do things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, it seems like the watchman could be a really good um, analogy for uh, the elders also. And I want to go back to Ezekiel. Uh, this is Ezekiel 33, and I think it's it's uh, it's. I think it's an, it could be a really important thing for us because we remember we were in Ezekiel 34 when, when God was mad at the people and he said, I am going to send you the good shepherd. That's in 34. But in 33, he's also talking about um, that he's upset with the watchman, that, that what he's going to do for the watchman. And um, again, 33 would be good for to read the whole thing, but we're just going to do a... a part of it in Ezekiel 33 verse 7 Son of man I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel so hear the word I speak and give them warning from me when I say to the wicked O wicked man you will surely die and you do not speak out to dissuade him from his ways that wicked man will die for his sin and I will hold you accountable for his blood but if you do warn the wicked man and turn from his, to turn from his ways, and he does not do so, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. That is, to me, I take that seriously as a prophecy for elders in the New Testament church. And I think we can go to some passages um, in the New Testament. If you go to Hebrews 13, just a couple that I think really are, are wor uh, words for elders. But the, the language is to me is unmistakable about it referring back 
to uh, Ezekiel uh, 33. If you turn with me to Hebrews uh, 13, Hebrews 13, uh, 17, kind of want to skip here a little bit. Uh, we'll do 17 first. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. I'll just read this part. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. They must give an account. That's what Ezekiel 33 said. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage uh, to you. This is, this is I, I know this passage has given a lot of elders a uh, pause over the years. I, I remember it used to really bother my grandpa Carol about this thing. But I think, you know, this isn't, the, I think that his, his nervousness might have been that if some people go away, then, then he, that he might be accountable for them going away because, because, you know, he didn't keep them in or something like that. But I don't, I don't think, if, if we look at Ezekiel 33, what it means is that we will be held account as elders if we don't do... If we don't tell them, we don't warn our sheep about the things and they and they go and and they go away and, and they are lost, then that is dangerous for us. We do we can be taken account for that. But if we warn them, if we warn them with love and we, we tell, hey, this isn't right, and and they still go away, then then we would not be guilty, guilty of that. But even then, there's there's a lot to think about here for elders being the watchmen of the flock to, to looking out for your sheep and and trying to guide them and, and help them um i want to go to first peter 5 2 not first peter 5 2 first peter 5 the first four verses just on this uh, point if i can find first peter First Peter and uh, five. Let's see, is that what I want? Yeah, I think so. First Peter five, uh, first four verses. This sounds like the uh, the uh, watchman again. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Elders are watchmen, and we're watching. And when that great shepherd appears, when he comes to the sheep pen, we will know, and we will be able to have the sheep that will be able to go and go and follow him. So I think, and I feel there's a, I just feel there's a whole bunch of really good analogies that we can use for the watchman. I can't uh, distinguish which one is more right than the others. And uh, if, if you really think the one you like is the one that's right, then good. And then praise God for that and, and go with that. Um, but th we, throw it, we threw out at least four options there of maybe who the watchman could be. And, and uh, hopefully that will spur some more conversation and discussion amongst, amongst you, you all. Any comments or questions on... On any of that, uh, Brian Tudoro said the Greek word for watchman elsewhere implies a servant. Uh, John eighteen six, uh, sixteen through eighteen, uh, that would also fit with John the Baptist, right? Uh, and the elders too. But. Mark thirteen thirty three uh, tells us to watch and pray. Uh, John the Baptist also has a watching job uh, to make sure people see the gate when he comes. Uh, slash follow the true shepherd that was Wendy Range uh, Glenn Woody said that first verse in Ezekiel says that their watchmen were given a sword which spiritually resembles the elders in Christ Church today the sword we've been given the word of God yeah. good good comments excellent excellent passages and they add it anything else yeah, that's anything it. else here All right, um, so he leads them out. He calls his own sheep. The shepherd calls his own sheep by name. He leads them out. Um, shepherds can make their own uh, sounds that the sheep are familiar with, and they know the voice, and they, and they uh, follow him out. Um, how, how do they know? How do we know his voice? How do we know his voice and know to follow him? What is his voice? 
The word of God? The word of God, yeah. Mike's pointing pointing down to his uh, his sword in his lap there. So uh, we know his voice because we have his word, right? We have his word and we understand his word and we do- delve into his word and we examine his word and we're familiar, familiar with his word. We, we, the more we study it, the more we're familiar with his word. And so when we see things in our life, we recognize, yes, that is good. That is good. That is in the word. And that is what Jesus has told me to do so we can follow him. We, we can recognize um, his voice. Uh, they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. We'll flee evil. Right? We'll flee evil. We'll recognize, we recognize evil because we know it's so different from what we're hearing from our shepherd. It's so different. It's scary. And we don't want to be anywhere involved with that because we know the outcome of, and the wages of our, our sin. We know what can happen from that. So we want to run away from those things. We do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used his figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So it's, that's interesting. They didn't understand the shepherd's voice when he was trying to make this, uh, this parable to them. Let's look at verse 7 through 10. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. So we have our I am statement here. If you uh, check your charts, our uh, treasure hunt inventory, um, you can uh, type in or write in uh, another I am statement. I am the door or I am the gate, depending on your translation. He is the gate. How is Jesus the gate? How is Jesus the door? I'd like to hear a little uh, discussion on, on that. Well, no one, no one goes to, to God w- without going through Jesus. You can't get to God without going through Jesus. He's the gate that we have to go through in order to you know, be with the Father. Right. John 14 and 6 this is going to be another I am statement here in, in you know two months or so <laughs> if we get there. I am... The way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Right? So Jesus says, I am the way. I am the way. I am the door. I am the gate. No one has access to God except for, for uh, through me. Um, Excuse me. Go ahead. It's, it's only true uh, um, that we, we are able to, uh, you know, to, well, God, I mean, Jesus, whenever we pray to God, Jesus is there. You know, to uh, the word I'm looking for. Uh, you know, we, well, we can't, we can't even. God can't even hear our prayer without right. going through Jesus. He's the one who's standing for us. You know, before the Father. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Okay. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Also, right. we 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 pray to the Father through the name of the Son with the help of the Holy Spirit. Right. Uh, all three, the whole Godhead is 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 helping us communicate with with them. And I say them, the, the three personhoods of, of the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all three of those are involved with our, with our communication with him. That's true. Acts 4 and 12, salvation is found in no one else, right? No one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by, to man by which we must be saved. And what is that name? Jesus. It's Jesus. That's his name. That's his name. No other name. Uh, can uh, can bring us salvation. That's the only way that we can be saved is through him. He's the gate, he's the door, he's what's open uh, for us. And I was uh, thinking about this, there's, uh, and we'll just, we'll start quizzing people, trivia questions. How many examples do we have through the Old Testament? And I sh- probably shouldn't open this up because there's going to be way more examples than I thought of, I'm sure. Um, of as long as you were in the door, as long as you were in the door, you were saved. How many examples do we have of stories throughout the Bible can you think of? Can you think of any examples? As long as you're in the door, you're saved. Anybody? Well, you had the uh, Passover in Egypt. We had the Passover, right? The death of the firstborn. What did they have to do? They had to all be inside the house. Right. Door had to be closed. What had to be on the door? The blood of the Passover lamb. Now, that's right. extremely symbolic, right? That's the, that's the Passover lamb. Later, it's the Lord's Supper is what we're going to be partaking 
right? It's that's symbolic of, of that. The blood that was saving had to be over there. It had to be a lamb without blemish. And you needed to be in the door. The door needed to be closed. Your whole family, right? Your whole family was all in there partaking of the Passover uh, meal and the death angel would uh, um, would pass over. Yeah, you had to be inside the door. Anything else? A couple people said the ark. The ark. How many doors were in the ark? One. One door, right? One door. Everybody went through it, right? That'd be a... Probably not, wouldn't be to code, maybe, <laughs> these days. There was a window. It's an escape route, I guess. Um, but there was one door, and, and who shut that door? God. God shut that door. God opened that door, right? So it, it's just amazing when I started thinking about some of those examples. Those are two that I thought of. And I guess there's another one. There would be a um, – did anybody else say another one? Or I don't want to no. preempt anybody. But um, Remember when the spies went into uh, Jericho? Mm-hmm. Right. Remember, who, remember whose house they – Lady that was a yeah, Rahab, Rahab, right? Rahab, right? And if, if you remember that they sent to her and they told her to that when we come in, yeah. yeah, they had to put it, he had they had to put a scarlet uh ribbon outside, which is very symbolic, also. The blood right. of Jesus saves, right? But they said, You and anyone you want to say, any of your household, you must be in and have behind the door, right. you have to have the door shut and you have to be in there and do not come out of the door, right? Do not come out of the door. And just there it is again. It's the same thing as Jesus being the door and uh, the, the only way for salvation. And we need to be inside. Um, I guess maybe one I'll go to. Exodus uh, 29. Um, I'm not going to go there because I, I want to keep, keep going a little bit here. Anyway, Exodus 29 and 42. I'll have someone look that up. Exodus 29 and 42. Maybe you can throw it up there. I don't know. Um, it talks about the sacrifices, and it says that the, you would have the sacrifice at the door or the opening of the of the tabernacle. You'd be in the courtyard, and and the, the sacrifice, which, of course, in New Testament times, sacrifice is Jesus that saves us. But it says the sacrifice would be right there at the door, the opening of the tent, and God says, and I will meet you there really good i will meet you there at the door at the opening of the uh, tabernacle where the sacrifice was to be uh, performed so there's one more example and i bet uh, we could probably if we really did a study on that we'd probably find a whole bunch other um, uh, possibilities through there okay um we're gonna have to quit here pretty soon so i want to just keep going here just a little bit Um, 11 through 13 i am the good shepherd The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I'm going to keep going. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it up from me, takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. So we have our another I am statement. You can add that to your uh, chart. I am uh, the good shepherd. I believe this is just... uh, I believe this is prophecy fulfilled. I think it is specifically prophecy fulfilled. I think it's a fulfillment of Ezekiel 34, the prophecy in Ezekiel 34 that I'm going to send a good shepherd to you. And Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of that prophecy. When he says, I am the good shepherd, they get really upset with him because he says this. And I I think that's why, because they totally understood that he was claiming to be that uh, new king, that uh, Messiah. Um, We have the, uh, the hired hand, the hired hand. Um, if we go back to, uh, Ezekiel 34, one through 10, the beginning of that, uh, chapter, um, it says, why, why does it say, uh, the hired hand doesn't care for the sheep? What, what's the implication there? The hired hand cares about what? Money. Yeah, he's the hired hand. I don't think the implication is lost on anyone there that this this person cares about more about their power and their money that they're having as opposed to the flock, 
as opposed to the uh, sheep. And this was the problem back in Ezekiel 34 when God was upset with the shepherds of Israel, the, the leaders of, of Israel. He says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. It was a warning to these shepherds, these hired hands that were in it for, for their, uh, their money, their own financial gain. Um, and I, I know, you know, we can go, we can go to, uh, was it first Timothy five and talk about the, the elder that does, serves the office well is worthy of double honor, but we kind of all shy, shy away from that. We, we don't want, we know what bad things can come from some of those, some of those things. Not that it was wrong, but it it could be, could be a stumbling block for, for, uh, for many people. I want to go to, uh, verse 16 before we finish here and, and point out something in verse 16 that I think is important. Um, in verse 16, it says, I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen or the sheep fold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one. And my version, NIV version reads flock. And most of your versions probably read flock. If you have the King James version, though, it, it reads fold. It reads fold. And if you, you have that slide, there's a slide. I want to show the difference between two Greek words there. So the, the first fold in that verse, if you're in the King James, the first fold in that one is the one we talked about earlier, the, the all lay, which means the, the barrier, the, the enclosure, a, a structure, a really structured thing where the sheep were all brought in the night and they were all there together for the night and they were let out in the pasture the, the next morning. That first one is a, a fold. The second fold, if you're reading the King James, you'll see fold twice. The second should not be translated fold. That that was uh, a mistake by Jerome in a, the Latin Vulgate. He translated it as, it is a completely different Greek word there. That Greek word there is, uh, and I looked up the strong, so you can look it up later if you want to check it out. Greek 4167. It's uh, poine, poine. And it means a flock, a, a flock of sheep um, out in the pasture and, uh, you know, um, like we, what we'd normally think. So it says here that Jesus says that, I have other sheep not of this enclosure. Okay? I have other sheep not of this of this enclosure with these with these barrier of walls around them. And I am going to bring them in. They will listen to my voice also, and I'm going to make them not one fold. That that translation really I think is unfortunate in the King James version. I'm, I'm not going to we're not going to take those new sheep that want to hear my voice and we're not going to put them in and fold them into that fold. We're going to take them both together. We're going to knock down the barrier walls around them and we're going to make them one flock, point A. It's a completely different word. And you can look up the Strong's and see the difference in the definitions. The first one is a, a closure, a palace. A, I mean, most of the times it is like a, a real enclosed, built structure um, thing. And I think this is, I think this is important. I, maybe some people think that maybe I'm reaching here. But I feel it's important because who was the initial sheep pen? I mean, who's Jesus talking about here? I have other sheep. So who's he talking about is that fold? Yeah, what sheep? The Jews, right? The Jews. Right. The Jewish and the Jewish people that were going to be following him, right? right? I have other sheep. Who who are the other sheep? Gentiles. They're the Gentiles, right? And almost everyone agrees with that except for the Mormons. The Mormons have some other ideas on some of those things, but... But other sheep is the Gentiles, which are going to come in in Acts 10 with Cornelius, right? Other sheep have I, and we're going to include them in, and there will be one flock right. that I will lead through the pastures, that no longer enclosed with barriers around them. And how is, how is that going to happen? Well, how did, the, how did the sheepfold want that to happen? All we have is the book of Acts explaining every single day, right up until Acts 15, when we had to actually write out a letter to everybody. How did the Jews in that sheepfold want the Gentiles to be included in? Well, they wanted them to be included from the, the old ways of, of, of Moses, when Moses 
when the, the laws of Moses, they wanted them to be circumcised. Exactly and, right. And, and, and saying that's the only way that they would accept them. Right. Yeah. You know, so the, this sheep, would. this sheepfold here, right. the Jews, they they were they weren't really keen on them coming in. But you know, once the once the you know Peter said, hey. <laughs> They, the Holy Spirit came down from God. I mean, we can't deny God. And so they were willing to accept him, but there was problems, right? right. Well, yes, we'll accept him in, but they have to be like us. Right. They have to be circumcised. They have all these all these Jewish walls and barriers that we're going to put on them, mm -hmm. right? They had to be broken down. How did, Jesus, how did Jesus bring them together? He broke down. He broke down those walls, right? He was right. crucified. The veil was ripped. The veil was ripped. And everybody had access as one flock um, after that. And I want to just read. Um, so it is. I think it is important. I just want to iterate that, that King James Version. That, that's, um, it's unfortunate that Jerome that used this, the word for, uh, it was a completely different Greek word, but he still used the word for the, uh, the enclosure. They were coming out of the fold and they were going to be one flock. But if you look at Ephesians chapter 2, and I think we'll, we're going to have to leave it at that. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, verses 14 through 18. I think this I think this is beautiful language here, so I'll try to get through it. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 14 through 18. Um, this, to me, explains uh, John uh, 10 and 16, about how the fold was going to be turned into the, the flock with the other sheep and all going to be brought together. But how's that going to have to happen? Those walls, that enclosure for those that sheepfold of the Jews, that it was going to have to be torn down. The wall, the separating wall between between the Gentiles that are in this nice rigid structure thing that, that God set up for them originally, and all these Gentiles that were scattered throughout the world, that wall was going to come down and they were going to be one. They were going to be one flock. And I think it's beautiful uh, with Ephesians 2 and 14 through 18 if we put it with John 10 and 16. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves. And let's see, I'm not in the right spot. I could tell right away that that was not right. John 2, or Ephesians 2, 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. And there's another thing for the watchman there. We have access to the Father by the one spirit. He tore down that wall of hostility and he brought us together. Through what? Through his death through the death of the Son, which we're going to be uh, celebrating and participating as best we can here uh, shortly with all of us. This is, a, this is a, a, a great, I think, analogy here that Jesus is telling us about the parable of the sheep. And that wall, that, that fold was going to be uh, changed. It was going to be changed. And the uh, other sheep were going to be brought in um, to the fold. So we're going to leave it off there, I think. And uh, was there any other comments real quick? on Anybody have some things there that we need to we good? Yeah, good everybody good okay um with that i think uh let's see we're gonna have another song right is that i didn't know the schedule i think we're gonna have another song and uh um and then we'll uh, uh hear from um brother marty with the uh thoughts on our blessings and um the lord's table thank you for being here today i really appreciate it and i appreciate all your comments God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds I hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, I part throughout the universe displayed, and sings my soul.
Good morning. This is the time that we traditionally set aside to take up a collection for the saints. However, this is not the traditional manner in which we usually do it. We'd like to be gathered together as the body of Christ and pass the plate, take up our collection in our normal way, but because of the circumstances in this difficult time, we're not able to do that. So we will pass this on to the church once we're able to gather together again. The church is well situated for this. We're not needing the money right away but he wants it so that we can do his work here on the earth we're all richly blessed during this difficult time some of us may have more challenges than others so each of us will have to try and figure out for ourselves what's the best way and what can we do to give back to the church the lord understands that we're still obeying his will by giving as we have prospered some of us have prospered more than others, and especially during these times, some of us may have lost their jobs or not able to work as much as they usually can. So each of us has to make a determination what and how best to give as he has commanded us to do. Opportunities we have are still the same. The money is needed to help those who may be out of work because of the situation we're in and to give to the evangelists so that they can spread the gospel of Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer this morning, acknowledging that you are our God and that you provide for us. You give us more than what we need in this world to survive. We're going through a difficult time. You understand that. You understand our decisions on how much to give and what we're able to do. We pray that you'll just help us to examine our lives to see the abundance of blessings that we have, and to give back to you in an appropriate manner. To give because we want to, and we feel it's a privilege to do so, and that we're so blessed that we're able to do so. It's your son Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Savior Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We're here to remember His sacrifice for us. We're not gathered in the usual way, but we're still gathering as He has commanded us to remember Him as He has commanded us. Sometimes I have a little st trouble staying focused, even during normal times when we're gathered together physically, but especially so now in this time of disruption and uncertainty. I started thinking of Jesus and of His death. I think of him dying so that I could be cleansed of my sins. I think of those sins and how poor of a job I'm doing, trying to avoid them. I think that I need to be asking forgiveness for those sins. I think of better ways to do a better job of being obedient to God. Those are all good things to be thinking about. They're all things that I need to do, things that we all need to be thinking about and doing. However, in doing that, I have lost focus because now I'm thinking about me. Now it's become about me. And it's not about me. This time is supposed to be about Jesus and about his sacrifice for us. I should be thinking about Jesus dying not only for me, but for the sins of the whole world. I should be thinking about how Jesus died cruelly and undeservedly. I should be thinking about why he died. What he died for was to obliterate the sins of the world from the sight of God. Why he died was because he loved us so much. That's the true focus we all need to be thinking about at this time. What we all need to be remembering. The beatings, the ridicule, the torment, the cross. 
they're all mechanics of the event, and they're important, and we need to think about them, and we need to remember them. However, the main focus for us should be the motivation, his love for us. Isaiah 63, 8 and 9 says, For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. Jesus has redeemed us from our sins through his blood. Isaiah 38 and 17 says, Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness. But you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. It was the love of God for us that provided a way for us to be redeemed, giving his son as the plan of salvation. It was the love of Jesus for us that he did the will of his father, sacrificing himself, gave up his life on the cross so that we could have our life again. That's what we focus on this morning. That is what we remember, our Savior and his love. Bow with me now as I ask for a blessing on the loaf. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you so thankful that we do have this plan of salvation, that you loved us enough to provide a way for us to be redeemed back to you despite our sin. We thank you that your Son was sent to this earth to teach us your word, to live a life of service and obedience to you, and that finally he went up on the cross and died there, giving up his blood so that we could be saved. We pray that you would bless this loaf that represents the body that he gave up on the cross. We are heartbroken that he had to die such a cruel death for us, but overjoyed that he would be willing to do so, that his love for us was so great that he would do anything to save us. As we partake of this loaf now, help us to focus on your son and to focus on his love. It's in his name we pray. Amen. How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful the hands that served the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walked the long dusty roads and the hill to the cross. How
and the love of the King. How beautiful the hands that serve the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful. Our Father in heaven, we come to you with joyful reverence. Father, we're thankful that you wanted to reconcile with us. We're thankful that your Son shed his blood, giving us hope in a new covenant of forgiveness of sins. We ask you, Father, that you would bless this cup and help each and every one of us to partake in it in a way that it glorifies you and in a way that strengthens us. In your Son's name, Jesus, amen.
Well, thanks for uh, everybody uh, worshiping with us today. Um, thankful for you to uh, come back on our uh, quick uh, adjustments that we had to make. Um, uh, we're uh, learning a lot of things about technology and if anything. <laughs> And uh, I'm getting to spend a lot more time with my son, so that's always a good good thing. Uh, he might be getting tired of me, so who knows? So I hope it goes on for a couple of months. No, I'm just kidding. I don't hope it goes on for a couple of months, but maybe uh, we can keep spending time with each other. So maybe we'll go fishing or something. So um, I have uh, more announcements than I uh, had notes for my class. So um, this could <laughs> maybe take a little little while here. Um, and if uh, while I'm doing this, uh, go ahead and start commenting in on some notes or some announcements that you'd uh, like read, and that will take care of some of those here at the at the end. Um, I guess so one thing I will mention is that we were we were going to have a half an hour kind of session before services, uh, where we're going to have some songs that were played, and we have a little thing called Voices from the Past. Um, we're we're going to cut those songs out, but we're going to have a um, we're going to do the voices from the past uh, here at the end after our closing prayer, our dismissal prayer. Uh, if, if you want to, you can stay tuned in for about, I don't know, it's 20 minutes or so, I think, uh, and hear a couple of voices from the past that you, some of you might recognize and uh, appreciate um, listening to. Um, so if you'd like to stay after the closing prayer for that, that would, that would be great. Um, we'd like to offer some happy birthdays this week uh, to Linda Garland. Teresa Brady, Allison George, Brandon Engel, and Carla Fetters, who's who's in our group. Who's in our group? So you know what that means. <laughs> okay, here we go. Everybody, join with us on on like a 15 second delay. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Carla. Happy birthday to you. I think you should put the camera towards her. <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I can't fear, fear for my life on that one. All right. Um, uh, yeah, Nick happened to mention to me, and I, and I saw it this morning too, that if uh, you might have had a kind of an emotional uh, uh, shout out on Facebook this morning, that uh, this morning would have been Junior Barlow's birthday, and it said, wish him a happy birthday, and I really wish I could. Uh, but uh, he's no longer with us, but uh, he's with us in spirit. He probably would have actually been excited about uh, <laughs> these uh, small groups that we're trying to still uh, follow the Lord with. So um, I, I just a little thought about him today. Uh, Sophia George expresses her heartfelt gratitude to the congregation uh, for her sunshine box this past week. So we appreciate her and we hope that she's uh, healing and going to be able to get better and come back with us once uh, we can start meeting again. Um, a sincere thank you to the congregation for the outpour of love expressed to the Thompson family. Uh, we had uh, kind of a, uh, showered them with some gifts and some important uh, necessities. Uh, they were very grateful for the incredible generosity from the brethren for their care package and freezer meats. And I will just uh, shout out a little bit on top of that. Uh, I walked into the church yesterday and saw, saw all the gifts that uh, you were uh, showering on this family it is uh, truly wonderful. It's very overwhelming. So just so grateful for the, uh, for the brotherhood and the love that uh, you showed one to another. So very appreciative of that. And now I can't see. Uh, let's see. Okay, the Pleasant Hill children between the ages of preschool to sixth grade will have children's classes during the week. First, on Zoom, I guess. So first Zoom session is on Tuesday from 3 to 4.30. Uh, I, she is keeping this kind of local, but she's willing to talk with some other people in other congregations if you want to kind of do something in your little local group. Uh, she might be able to help you out a little bit on that. Um, the first Zoom session is on Tuesday from 3 to 4.30. Let Ginger know if you did not receive a Zoom invitation uh, they're going to do some crafts, I think, and she has crafts and individual bags that she's going to deliver to your place, I think, and uh, if, if you need that, then let, let her know. So I'm letting her handle all that stuff, so just contact her about all that stuff. Looks like it's pretty fun, though. Uh, the young ladies' development class are reminded to work on the cover graphics for the children's songbooks. Send your final to Ginger once it's completed, so... 
sounds like you guys might have had an assignment or something. So you have time. So let's go ahead and uh, get that done. Please pray for Marge Turnquist's comfort and healing. Her eyes suffered a damaged cornea due to a fall in her garden last week. We've been in constant contact with her and her uh, sound, as bad as that sounds, she seems so, uh, she seems so upbeat when she's texting and stuff. So, um, but we really miss her and can't wait to see her, her again. She's much better. She's much better. Yeah. Okay. She's much better now. This is good here. Um, if you need uh, bread or juice for the Lord's Supper for your assigned group, uh, please do not hesitate to let me or uh, Ginger know. Um, I, we, we tried to, we, I'm in education, so I kind of, uh, I see some kind of not so good things on the horizon. And, uh, I was anticipating, you know, that at least a month, um, I don't want to alarm anybody, but you know, it could be longer than that. So, um, if you, uh, are getting short or you're going to run out on that, uh, let me or Ginger know. Um, we will come to your doorstep. We are perfecting a drop and run away really fast method. It's been working pretty good. Basically, I don't get out of the car and Ginger does all the running. So it's uh, working working really well for us. Um, let's see. Uh, during this COVID-19 crisis, we do want you to be careful. We do want you to take it seriously. Even if you are not concerned for yourself, a lot of us are not overly concerned for ourselves, um, we ask that you love your neighbor, um, especially the household of faith. We are also anticipating that some of you uh, might suffer some economic strife um, during the situation. If you have any needs, we ask that you please uh, contact an elder or deacon. Let us know if you know somebody in our flock has needs. Um, let us know. We we want to help, and this is what the, uh, you know, seek ye first kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, that we need to obey that verse and understand what that verse uh, means. Please continue to keep Kelsey Wood, Whitney Thorson, and I'll add Madison Twaddell in your prayers for healthy pregnancies and uh, safe deliveries. Um, I think Kelsey is like April, right? Like, she, like less than a month or something, right? So uh, definitely keep Kelsey in uh, your prayers. Um, it's coming on pretty soon. Uh, please pray earnestly for our many brothers and sisters who work in the medical emergency and military fields. Special prayers for Mike and Cindy Brady, Aiden Twaddell, Alex Needham, Megan Shrek, Brandon Engel in the days and months ahead. Um, as well, may God provide comfort to the many patients currently afflicted with COVID-19 and and we pray for any uh, brothers and sisters in the in the brotherhood, um, the extended brotherhood, if, if you're dealing with this, or um, and try to keep all our elderly people um, away from it. It's it's not good. Um, continue to keep uh, Steve, the Steve and D. Thompson family in your prayers. They have 10 days left in their quarantine, and uh, may God bless them physically and and spiritually. Uh, I received this from Teresa Brady last night. I'm just going to read her uh, prayer request. She says, I got word today that there is one positive COVID-19 patient at Luther Park, but not in the same campus of where my dad resides at Trinity Center. I'm asking for a Passover prayer. We just talked about this today. I'm asking for a Passover prayer, just as in the days of the original Passover when the people of Israel painted their doorways with the blood of a lamb. I'm requesting a prayer that the Lord will allow the virus to pass by Trinity Center and my dad's floor. My grandmother and my great aunt, my great uncle and his wife also reside at Trinity Center. We have much invested in that building. So let's uh, keep Teresa's family in uh, your prayers this week as well. Uh, we received a thank you letter in the mail. Thank you for extending so much love and support to Brad's family. This is from the uh, Evans family, uh, Jamie Evans' uh, brother's family. Thank you for extending so much love and sub Jamie Ingalls. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to, I heard Ryan yelling from a distance right there. Jamie Ingalls, uh, brother's family. Thank you for extending so much love and support to Brad's family, both during his illness and after his passing. We greatly appreciate the warm thoughts expressed in your cards, prayers, food, and lovely floral arrangement you sent to the funeral. They all brought a source of comfort to us all. So we Remember them as they go forward. It's uh, not easy losing someone, and uh, there will be grief for a while. Church meetings. I have uh, Murray Road Memorial Day meeting is scheduled 
for May 23rd and 24th. Let's all pray that uh, this thing is done and that, that they can hold that meeting. That'd be great, really great. May 23rd and 24th Memorial Day meeting. Pleasant Hill Vacation Bible School will be June 14th through 19th with Wade Stanley. Uh, God's Builders will be the theme. Annual Midwest Bible Camp Out uh, Eminence is scheduled for June 29th through July 3rd, 2020. The church, which meets at Prince Road, Alton, Illinois, oversees this event. Information can be found on uh, their website. Kirksville Church of Christ plans to host a two-weekend Bible study this summer between July 25th and August 2nd. And you can visit uh, their website for details as well. Um, Wednesday, uh, we're not really, we're kind of just, you know, winging a lot of things. But uh, generally, last uh, Wednesday, we, we kind of have family fellowship nights on, uh, we're streaming and uh, we're kind of doing a Bible trivia and on certain topics and stuff. And I think we'll probably still do that um, this Wednesday night, if or we might move it to a different night, depending on some things. So, um just stay tuned, and we'll kind of post that out on our Facebook page about when we're going to meet and uh, do some trivia. I got some stuff kind of all ready to go, so we could possibly use that. So um, we have learned a lot today, so we'll probably be setting up a little bit different thing, and we probably won't be using our, our building anymore unless, it, unless we have internet in it sometime. So uh, to be honest, we weren't really sure how it worked last week, and we just God was our hotspot, I think, and it's just really kind of worked out well so we were still nervous about it today and we thank uh, mike and shirley warner for opening their house and uh, you should have seen shirley dusting everything really quick as we were trying to get everything ready but but they provided us with uh, casey's pizza so we were uh, actually pretty happy that we actually came over here for that so um we have i guess some uh, kind of sad news for our congregation but it's good news for smart roads congregation so i guess that's uh, good. Uh, Nathan Williamson, one of our members, um, is going to be transferring uh, his membership to uh, Smart Road. Um, we have sent him uh, with a letter, and we'd, we'd like to read that letter uh, for you that we're sending with him. It says, To the elders of the Smart Road Church of Christ, Gerald Clevenger and Randy Tetmeyer, Dear brother, Nathan Williamson has requested that his membership be transferred from the Pleasant Hill Church of Christ to the Smart Road Church of Christ. Nathan was baptized on August 6, 2014 and has been a faithful member since that time. He has participated in the worship service by helping and offering prayers at the Lord's table and publicly reading the scripture. It is our feeling that he has the talent to be even more involved in the worship service and that in time, with your encouragement, he will. We are so thankful that he has sought out a woman in the Lord to marry and a faithful congregation to meet with. This attests to his desire to walk closely with the Lord. We commend him to your oversight and fellowship, and we have confidence that he will continue to grow in faith and knowledge sincerely in Christ, the elders at Pleasant Hill Church of Christ. And we weren't sure we wanted to read that or not, but I, I, I you know, we kind of felt it was probably good that uh, people understand the process of uh, when they're transferring membership that we want to commend them with a, with a letter and to the care of uh, elders of another, uh, another flock. We have some excellent, great news. Um, you might think we're down one member because of Nathan, but uh, we're not. We're up. Um, well, we're even, I guess. <laughs> we're even. Um, Mike and Shirley Warner's son, Stephen Thompson, who has been uh, meeting with us for uh, quite a while, has decided he would like to place his membership uh, with us here at Pleasant Hill. Um, we've talked with him at length over the past couple of months, and uh, we are very confident in his immersion into Christ and his submission to the Lord. And... Uh, we feel that he brings some experiences to our flock um, that other people might not have. Um, he's battled uh, stage four cancer for two years, two years now, and um, you know uh, they brought him back. I mean, he was he was gone, and he, they they brought him back, and he uh, um, he has some experiences of uh, of understanding the. Uh, the ultimate importance of your spiritual soul versus your physical life. So he, he has some things that we can really draw on, I think, in our congregation that can really help us. And so we're, we're ecstatic that uh, he has decided to um, place his membership uh, with us. I would like to read his request that he sent to us uh, uh, this week. He says, I, Stephen Thompson, would love to join the membership fold that is at Pleasant Hill Church of Christ. I submit myself before the elders and gladly with open heart believe in the guidance given. 
Although God has shown my search would lead me here, he has patiently waited to see me crawl out of the world and into the way through Jesus. I am humbled, broken, and flawed in this earthly body, so I pray. I pray that this serves me as daily reminders that the kingdom is waiting in all its glory. Through the grace of God, this is his will. So we are uh, very happy to receive him in, and we wanted all our members to know that we have a, a new brother in Christ that's uh, going to be worshiping uh, with us, and, but we're going to keep him in quarantine as long, <laughs> as long as we can for safety reasons, and then hopefully he can, we can all come back and join together in the, in the body. I've been telling people lately that I've been trying to uh, uh, keep track of all the good things that have been uh, coming out of this uh, troubling times, and this is definitely one of the, uh, it's, it's really high on my, on my list right now. So we welcome Steve to the congregation. Any other announcements? Uh, yeah, uh, also keep Bob Milner, who has stage four cancer as well, uh, from Warrensburg Church of Christ. Bob Milner from Warrensburg Church of Christ, yeah. stage four cancer. Keep him in our keep prayers. Him in your prayers. Uh, Kaylee, uh, my wife Kaylee. Uh, <laughs> well, her, thank you her, for that her, introduction. Her, her, Kaylee Herman. Uh, so you can stay at say. our place tonight, so by the way. Uh, Kaylee uh, Herman is her, still. Her, her aunt, uh, okay. Aunt Kelly, uh, who's out in Colorado, uh, she's seven months pregnant and she's been exposed to somebody uh, who has. The virus, so okay. uh, please keep her in your prayers. Kaylee's aunt. Uh, she has a couple little ones as well already. Uh, or, well, another child that's under two. Uh, Kimber Wright said to please pray for uh, Jake Preston from Lawrence Church of Christ, who's in hospice. And Chris Nelson also commented uh, that he's asking for prayers as well as he goes through chemo treatment. Okay, all right. See, there's good. There's good here. We wouldn't even know all these all these prayer needs, you know, and it's good that we can do this. Uh, Wendy Range also commented on here that she's doing very well. So, okay. And so, were they ever sure? I did uh, not COVID. Not COVID, but yeah. but still, it was bad. <laughs> so yeah. From everything I heard, it was it was a rough go for her. So she's doing better, and that's uh, those are answered prayers as well. Anything from uh, the group that's here? Mm-hmm. New, New Orleans is getting bad, I think. Yeah, so right. Okay. On the seventh. 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 Seventh of April, Alonzo and Joyce are still going to be moving, but they're not going to go down to Louisiana and pick all their stuff up. To bring it back because Louisiana is not, it's, they're, they're starting to ramp up down there. So, right, yeah. Right, right. Right, yeah, yeah, it's not, we don't want you to do that. That'd be good. So, yeah. If you wait long, I mean, they might cancel my school for the rest of the year, and then I can just go down with you and help you bring everything back. You need my trailer anyway, I think. So, <laughs> so yeah, we can get you get all your stuff back up here. So, I've never been to Louisiana, so that'd be kind of interesting to go. So, me and Nick will road trip. We'll road trip. All right. Anything? Anything else from this group, or do you want us to sing Happy Birthday again, Carla? <laughs> okay. That will be the only one I hear this year. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Is anything else on the uh, announcement stream? No. Okay. Um, if not, I uh, I got really excited this week <laughs> when I heard Steve was going to uh, join our membership. So um, I got, I guess, pushy, and I asked him if he'd be interested in uh, leading our uh, closing prayer today. And uh, he graciously accepted and said it, it would be his honor, and he'd be actually very excited uh, to do that. So. Um, uh, if you will, uh, we're going to uh, introduce you to Steve, and uh, and he's going to lead us in our uh, closing prayer. After the closing prayer, if you remember, if you want to keep watching, you, you don't have to, but if you want to keep watching, there'll be some voices from uh, the past stream through for the next 20 minutes or so. So we'll ask Brother Steve to uh, lead us in our uh, closing prayer. Let us pray. 
Oh, Heavenly Father, we come to you today to thank you for today, the gift of life. Dear Lord, you breathed life into every one of us. And that is a miracle that we walk and talk. We have a consciousness and a mind inside us that we can't hold in our hands. Yet through every second and minute and hour of every day is a miracle that we are alive. Dear Lord, give us the wisdom to understand the things that we don't understand. Help those that, that edify us to give us the message that we need. Thank you for the hands that prepared the lessons and for everybody that is able to join and listen in this capacity for we know that this is only temporary, but it is your will. Dear Lord, through you, everything is possible. Thank you for Jesus Christ who died upon the cross that we may have everlasting life, the ultimate gift. Dear Lord, put your hand over the sick and the afflicted. You are the great comforter Heal them with your hand, the anxious and the fearful. Watch over them. Dear Lord, as we go through our, our days and our weeks, worrying about our families, worrying about our neighbors, help us to gain strength. Help us to be strong and to stay strong. In your word, all things are possible. In Jesus' precious name, amen. In the 15th chapter, the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, and we have this problem, starting with verse 36 and going down for a few verses. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them, that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark, and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas, and departed, being recommended by their brethren under the grace of God. Now here is a difference in judgment. No doctrinal problem here at all. But John Mark, uh, he had departed. He left them at Pamphylia. He went back. Now, the record never tells us exactly why he went back. Maybe the rigors of evangelism was too much for him at that time. And there are rigors to it, in case you didn't know it. But uh, something was there. There was a problem. And Paul says, I just don't believe that we ought to take him. And Barnabas was strong in the other direction. And so they parted. And Barnabas... He took John Mark, and Paul took Silas. Do you know this Barnabas? He really accomplished something. He was able to bring John Mark to where he belonged. He was able to bring out the best in this fall. Whatever it took, the recipe isn't given, but I know that it was accomplished. And the reason I know it was accomplished is in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, and verse 11. Years later, the Apostle Paul made a tremendous statement about this particular person. I'll turn there. In the, in the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy, and in verse 11, as Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Here the Apostle Paul years later shows what this man really was. Barnabas accomplished what he set out to do. What, an in, what a man he was to encourage people. That is really something. You know, the Bible speaks glowingly of him, and yet I've heard some people say it was rather drab regarding the comments concerning Barnabas. 
You know, if there was a man in the brotherhood today that was comparable to Barnabas and somebody who was called upon to introduce this man, I wonder how they'd do it. They'd probably stay awake the night before looking up every adjective and superlative and everything like that, trying to find words that would do this man justice. But you know, when God got ready to tell all he wanted to tell about him, if I might paraphrase a thing that was said regarding Lincoln, when God got ready to leave this man to the, to the ages, according to Acts 11, I read it a while ago, but I didn't emphasize it for, on purpose, all he said about him was this, for he was a good man, and that was it. Just a good man. That doesn't sound too flattering to us, does it? But in all the great things that Barnabas did, when it was all said and done and God said it, he's a good man, period. You know why that sounds sort of flat to us? It's because we do not know the definition of the word good in God's sight. Today we use it real loosely. See, if a person can stay out of the jail, he's a pretty good fellow. But that's not good in God's sight. It's different. Think of all of the things that this man did, yet God just said he was good. Let's step it up a little further. You try to think of everything that Jesus did in his personal ministry. You just rack your brain for a minute, if you will. Trying to think of every good work, every good thing that you can think about Christ in his personal ministry. And then I'll just start a verse for you and you can finish it. The Bible says he went about doing. There it is. Now we're getting a definition of the word as God sees it. I think this man is just beautiful. You know, I hear lots of con I hear many congregations speaking about their good elderships. That's fine. I hear congregations speaking about their efficient deacons. That's beautiful. I hear them talk about skills of maybe evangelists in their particular area, and that's all right. I've waited a long time. I don't know whether I will hear it or not, but I still hope to. I'm still longing. I'm still waiting for congregations to speak about their good encouragers. And I'm not so sure, but that might be our greatest need. There's no telling what disciples couldn't have accomplished if they'd have been encouraged. The encourager. That's the thing that's needed. Whenever congregations have efficient and capable encouragers, I think we'll see a change. And the beautiful thing about this, it doesn't take any particular skill because there are so many ways that you can do this. Maybe in some areas it takes some skill. But sometimes just little things, sometimes just a word, sometimes just a phone call, sometimes just an action, sometimes just a smile. This is within the capability of all people, men and women alike. All can encourage. Sometimes you can just encourage people and you don't say anything. A person asked me one time when there was a death in the community and she said, you know, I'd just like to go but I don't know what to say. You know what I told her? I told her, don't say anything. Just go. Shake hands. You don't have to say a word. Just presence is a form of encouragement. Too many times we think that we have to have a particular type of skill in order to do this. And that's not true. I illustrated this point uh, a couple weeks ago in Michigan. 
speaking on something comparable to this, not exactly, but uh, you can just encourage people by being around. Let's just play it this afternoon for just a moment as we close. Let's say for some unknown reason, everyone on this side of the building just didn't get here when we started. And then, maybe when I'm ten minutes into my speech, this whole side marches in and sits down. Now, you're not going to tell me that this side wasn't encouraged by your becoming. And you're not going to tell me that I wasn't encouraged by your coming, even though you didn't make any speeches at all. Once we get the thing into our minds that our very presence can be a form of encouragement, we'll be closer to the scriptural pattern of things. What does God owe me? He doesn't owe me anything at all. I owe Him. I am His. I have nothing of myself. It is all God's. What does the church owe you? The church doesn't owe you anything. You owe to the Lord in the church everything that you are and have. Because it belongs to God and you belong to God. When we talk about the church owes me this or uh, the church, oh, church owes me that and complain about the church, we'd better be careful. When we talk about the service of the church, we come on Lord Day morning and every other time we meet together to remember God. If God is here, what more can you ask? Do we meet together to entertain ourselves or do we meet together to please God? To focus our attention on Him or on ourselves? Do we meet together on Lord Day morning to think of and study about and learn of God and to grow more like Him? Or do we erect a mirror in front of our face, so to speak, and look at ourselves and want to please ourselves? What are we here for? Is the service the worship of God or the worship of man? Makes all the difference in the world. If we meet together on Lord Day morning and the Lord is pleased with us, then how can I be displeased? If we meet together and offer to the Lord out of a full heart a worship that pleases God, who am I to come along and say it's boring? I don't get anything out of it. Did you take anything to it? You'll never be bored with God if you think about God and worship Him. I'm reminded of a profound statement made in the book of Numbers, something that shocks me to the very depth of my being. Because the children of Israel, following God and God's law and led out into the wilderness journey, you would think that they had everything that God had provided, and they should have been happy. But in the 21st verse, uh, or 21st chapter of the book of Numbers, and verse 5, and the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. Our soul loatheth the light bread, what God gave them forty years in the wilderness. The manna that they could not provide for themselves, what God had decided was the most desirable, the most needed, and that God supplied to them, our soul loatheth it. The God of the universe sent fiery serpents among them and bit many of them and they died. And the people repented and said, we've sinned against God. God told Moses to put a brazen serpent on a pole, and everyone that looked at that, realizing, of course, their sin, when they did that, they would live. A living demonstration to them of their sin. When they got to where their soul loathed what God provided for them, 
they were to find out that God so loathed them. The point I wanted to make is that when you and I say that the service of the church is boring, that we're not really getting anything from it, we may find ourselves in the same condition as the children of Israel who said our soul loatheth this light bread. If God's will, and it is God's will, that we study His Word, that we meet together to worship according to the pattern that God gave, if we get to where that isn't enough for us, we will find out that we are not enough for God. Let's be careful. The church does not owe you an interesting service. The church owes the Lord a service offered to Him. And if you and I, in our service to God, don't do as much as we ought to, then that is our fault and our condemnation. But it's something that we owe to God. And if any one of us come together on Lord Day morning with our mind and heart centered upon God, we will be interested in what we offer to Him. Turning to the book of Peter, 1 Peter, actually I'll start in the latter part of the first chapter, leading up to the point and conclusion made. Seeing you've purified your soul and obeying the truth unto unfeigned love the bre- through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envy and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. How can we say that the service is not interesting or that we need more if, We desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow. If so be that ye have tasted, the Lord is gracious. The thing about it is, if we don't remember the Lord and what we're here for, then no wonder we don't get from the public service what the Lord meant for us to achieve and receive. And we don't offer to the Lord what God wants us to give to Him because we forget what we're there for. We have the emphasis in the wrong place. If we serve God, and if we're pouring our soul out to the Lord, we're not going to find out that it's not interesting. It will be interesting because our purpose is to interest God. We are here to please God. We're here to offer to Him. And if He is pleased with what we do, I'd better not be displeased, and you better not be displeased. Another thing in regard to this, if we offer to God as much as we can and pour out our soul to the Lord, we will become involved in the service. When we talk about it, it's an interesting. It's because we're not involved. We're sitting back, so to speak, and we're not giving, we're not offering, we're not doing. Uh, They aren't entertaining us. Uh, What is presented isn't something that captures our attention. Does the church owe you anything that we know? But if you owe to the Lord, and I owe to the Lord everything, if then in our public worship, if we pour out our soul to God, then we will get a great deal from it. They used to say those that don't take anything away from the service are those that didn't bring anything to it. If we don't give the Lord and pour our soul out to Him, it is not strange that spiritually we're weak. The better you do, the better the church will do. You're part of the church. And in the church there is no place that progress can better be made than in yourself. If you progress and grow, then the church progresses and grows because you're part of the church. Instead of saying, well, I don't, why doesn't the church teach me? 
The Bible is there for you to study and you to learn, and you are there to teach and instruct others. All right, start doing it. Instead of complaining about others, complain about ourselves and put ourselves to work and do and the Lord's work and the Lord's church will grow and develop. The church was nowhere commanded to grow in numbers because it can't obey that commandment. But we are told to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. We are to grow spiritually because we can't obey that. We are to grow. So instead of complaining about brethren not being this or that, let's look at ourselves in a spiritual mirror and put ourselves to work and develop and grow. We can always do a great deal more in the local congregation of encouraging and inspiring others to do better if we do better ourselves. We have to show the light in our own soul before we can spark a light in the soul of other people. You never inspire people. You never instruct people. You never build people up. You never encourage people by, to work. If you sit there like a bump on a log doing nothing and say, look, why don't you do this and why don't you do that and why don't you do something else? You don't do this well and you don't do that well. Show them how. There's nothing like the power of example. Acceptance. 